Church here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We'd like to start this morning with a few announcements. First of all, we'd like some help spreading the word among college students that Trinity is uh, accepting applications for church assistants and interns. This is for the summer and fall of 2022. Applications for this are available through the office or at office at trinityunc.info. Our February community ministry uh, information is please bring non-perishable food items during the month of February. This will be family size, not the industrial side. Uh, and that would be best. The food will be distributed by West Alabama Food Bank. This time of year is especially helpful to them, so thank you for participating in this February community ministry. You can put your donated item in the bin at the back of the sanctuary or by the glass doors by the parking lot. You may have already noticed from the availability of king cake and other Cajun specialties that the Christian season of Lent is coming up fast. It's coming up fast. That's pleasant. It's a little play on words there, coming up fast. <clears throat> anyway, please join us for our Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday, March 2nd in the sanctuary. Hope to see you there. And also, finally, thank you for wearing your mask indoors during worship. This is one way our community and church shares the love of Christ, and that's by doing what we can to protect the community and the most vulnerable folks among us. For more information on our, what we're doing to protect one another, you can just see the information on the back of your bulletin there. And at this time, I ask that you please stand as you are willing and able for the call to worship. Come, all who are weary and burdened, it is here you will find rest. We come, bringing our brokenness and joy, our sorrows and hopes to God. We bring pieces of ourselves, trying to understand the bigger picture. We cling to what we know and hold ourselves to all we don't understand. Come, Lord Jesus, help us find you in the breaking of the bread and in the sharing of the cup on this Communion Sunday. And now please remain standing as we sing number 170, the hymn, Oh, How I Love Jesus. $285,511 is 
based on the expenses that we anticipate we are going to need in 2022 to maintain our beautiful but aging building, to accomplish projects and plan by the trustees, to account for the rising cost of, well, everything, and to pay for the long overdue salary increases for our pastor, our church secretary, our financial secretary, and our music director, all of whom have done a yeoman job throughout the last you know, three years, please. The 2022 budget, however, does project a shortfall of about $30,300. This shortfall reflects a reduction in pledges and collections and a decline in membership over the past few years, which is something that pretty much every church is experiencing. Um, it also reflects a reduction in the daily parking that we that has occurred since the pandemic uh, began. Here's a bit of good news. Uh, we do have a reserve fund that could cover the deficit for this year if necessary. And I can assure you that as it has throughout the pandemic and does every year, the Finance Committee will continue to monitor the budget so that we can quickly adjust any changes in revenue and expenses. I want you to know, be assured, uh, a deficit budget is not news to Trinity. And in the past, we have found ways to economize and all of you have stepped up so that we have ended the year in better shape than we projected. And I want you to know that we are already exploring additional ways to generate additional revenue, including additional opportunities for to increase the daily parking revenue, and maybe conducting a yard sale uh, either this spring or this summer. And we want to make it easy for you to give, so we are exploring PayPal, Venmo, and automatic, draft, automatic bank draft options for those of you who would like to take advantage of that. As we continue to navigate the ever-changing landscape of the pandemic, we have so much to be thankful for and excited about. Thank you for your giving and for constantly stepping up to meet the challenges that we have faced and will continue to face. Please continue to support Trinity by volunteering your services, by increasing your giving if you are able, and by staying up to date with your pledges. Please know we recognize, value, and appreciate your faithfulness in offering your time, your talents, and your presence. Because of you, Trinity has been able to continue to share the love of Christ with our members and our community. And we're going to keep doing that, even as times continue to be trying and challenging. Please hear me say thank you for everything you do. I imagine that is especially teachers, especially nurses, especially doctors, especially parents of young kids. Uh, if you are a person who is weary today, we know that this prayer is for you. I bet you have some prayers that you would like to lift up today. I bet you might have somebody in particular that you're worried about, or a situation that is particularly troubling to you. Or maybe this morning you come here just to take a deep breath and to thank God for this beautiful weather um, or to thank God for something good that's happened in your life. What we're going to do is sing together a hymn, and as we sing, I invite you to let your prayers bubble up to the surface, and then we will pray together. Our call to prayer is hymn number 402, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian.
Gracious God, thank you for being with us today. You know each one of us better than we know ourselves. You are closer to us than our own heartbeats. And God, we come here this morning because our hearts are full. For some of us, our hearts are full of worry for people that we love and that we care about and are really struggling. God, for some of us, our hearts are full of grief or pain or anxiety. For others of us, God, our hearts are full of Gracious God, however we come this morning, we know that you know what's going on with us. We know that you know our deepest needs, our deepest anxieties, our deepest hopes, our deepest joys. So gracious God, as we come here this morning, will you take our every care and lay it in your feet. We trust God that you hear our prayers. You hear the times that we cry out. You hear the times our prayers spoken and unspoken. We ask God today that you send the power of your Holy Spirit upon us. We ask God today that you open our minds and our hearts and our ears and our hands and let us hear your voice in the singing of the hymns and the proclamation of the word and the beauty of the windows and the faces of those around us. God, as we take a deep Tune our spirits with yours. And we ask God that you help us see what you're doing in this world. That you help us to see what's happening in this congregation and beyond. We ask God that in some small or large way, you help us to be part of the bringing of your kingdom to this earth. God, we do, we know that we can do more together than we can do apart. So God, we some other things we can do to show our love to people. We can pray to Jesus when they're hurt. Yeah, that's a good one. What's he up? can heal us. Jesus is nice and he loves everyone yeah. and everyone shall respect Jesus when he okay. heals you. That's great. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. <laughs> you're, you're outshining me. Yeah, we can also do other things like we can give things to people that need help. Yes, other ways we can show love, right? 
I like it. All right. That was great. Thank you for uh, joining us on Sips for me today. And thank you for joining us, Nick. Now, after this, we'll go to the children's church. Thank you. 
so much. Have you ever thought that we do like the same 20 stories over and over in church? I feel like every church has like their top 20 favorites that they do. Um, and we just do that story over and over again. Well, today I'm going to tell you about a story that you might not be so familiar with. Um, it's from the book of Acts, which is about the Acts of the Apostles after Jesus walked the earth and was crucified and resurrected. This particular story is about a guy whose name was Paul. Originally it was Saul. He was a Roman soldier who had never actually met Jesus. And he persecuted Christians for the longest time. He would go out of his way to hunt them down in the synagogues. In fact, when Stephen was stoned, uh, Saul would hold the coats of the people who were throwing the rocks. Well, one day, Saul had this blinding experience, literally was blinded by a light, and he heard a voice, the voice of Jesus, say, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He had this very dramatic encounter with Jesus Christ, who had already died and been resurrected and then ascended into heaven. Eventually, he was healed by a member of the Christian community, and from that point forward, he changed his name to Paul, and he became one of the very important teachers and leaders in the early Christian church. However, a lot of folks in the Jewish community just didn't trust him. A lot of folks in the Christian community didn't trust him because of his record of uh, literally killing people. Um, he was a Roman citizen as well. Um, so the Roman citizens thought it was weird that he was part of this little band of Christian people. So, um, Often Paul would go into a community and sort of have a, a, a tough go of things. Our scripture is from Acts 27, beginning with verse 39. Well, I should probably set this up a little bit um, before I read it. Well, actually, no, I'm just going to read it, then we'll talk about it. Acts 27, 39. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but they saw a bay with a sandy beach where they decided to run the ship aground if they could. Cutting loose the anchors, they left them in the sea, and at the same time untied the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail into the wind and made for the beach. But the ship struck a sandbar and ran aground. The bow struck fast, and the bow struck fast and would not move, and the stern was broken to pieces by the pounding of the surf. The soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming and escaping, but the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to get there on planks or on pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone would reach land safely. This is the word of, Lord, the, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, we should probably talk about how Paul ended up on the ship. <laughs> Paul entered into a community which we now know as Greece and immediately started making people mad. There was a slave girl who um, would tell people's fortunes and they healed her of a demon that possessed her and she could no longer do that. So her owners were quite upset that they lost that source of income. He was jailed, then eventually there was an earthquake, he was released, and then he got imprisoned again because the Jewish people said he was a troublemaker. He was stirring up riots uh, among the Jews all over the world. He was even a ringleader of that Nazarene sect. He even tried to desecrate the temple, they said, by bringing in a Gentile, which was not actually true. But they threw him in prison, and he had been in prison for about two years. When there was a plot by the Jewish authorities to kill him, he was placed in protective custody. At his trial, there was a judge called Festus who heard these charges that were being brought against Paul by the Jewish community, who really did not have a lot of proof. Festus ended up con uh, consulting with King Agrippa, and this is what he said in Acts 25, 15. When Paul's accusers speak up, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had come to some points of dispute with him about their own religion, about a man named Jesus that Paul claimed that, that they said was dead, and then Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss at how to investigate such matters. 
So I asked if he'd be willing to come to Jerusalem and stand trial there for these charges. But Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision. I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. In other words, this trial came before him, and, and they were um, arguing that Jesus was dead, and, and Paul was arguing that Jesus was alive, and the judge was like, how am I supposed to investigate that? How am I supposed to figure that out? So he said, I was just going to take him and let them have their own trial, but Paul, who was a Roman citizen, invoked his rights and said, no, I want to go before Caesar. In fact, God had said to him, you're going to go to Rome, and you're going to proclaim Christ to Caesar. So that's how Paul began his adventure to Rome as a prisoner on a ship along with some other folks. Also on the boat was a centurion and some military folks who were guarding the prisoners and the sailors and the captain of the ship who were hired to take them there in the first place. Well they sailed for a while but it was getting to be winter and sailing conditions were poor. They got off course. There were quite a few delays. They reached this place called Fairhaven, and Paul said, we should stay here. The weather's bad. We should not move forward. But the, the, the guy in charge of the ship said, yeah, we can make it. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. So the centurion said, we're going to keep pl pl plunging ahead. We're going to keep going forward. And so Paul says, men, I can see that our voyage is going to be disastrous. And it will bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But still, the people in charge decided to go forward. Well, a few days into their trip, there were winds of hurricane force. There was a nor'easter and the ship was caught in the storm. They could not make any headway. In fact, their lifeboats were banging around so much they had to secure their lifeboats. They lowered the anchors because they didn't want to smash into the land that was around them. They threw their cargo overboard to try to light the ship to give them a better chance of survival. And then scripture says they passed ropes under the ship to hold it together. That's a stunning image. They passed ropes under the ship to hold it together. I imagine like a big thing of duct tape. They're just trying to tape it all together. Everybody was in trouble. Um, they could have made some different choices beforehand, but now they're in a crisis situation and they were doing everything that they could to save the ship. You can hear the desperation in the scripture. Have you ever found yourself in a desperate situation? Desperate to save something? Maybe it's your job or your marriage or a friendship. Maybe desperate to save a denomination or a church. Desperate to save a country. Desperate to hang on to your faith. Desperate for a better life. Desperate for a pain to stop. And you get to the point where you think, you know, I could have made different choices earlier, but it's too late now. And so you do everything in your power to duct tape things together. Everything in your power to just try to survive and get through it and make it work. Everybody on the ship was working so hard and doing their best. Their lifeboats, their last chances were useless. The storm is pummeling them. So they lower the anchors like dragging your feet, trying to keep from crashing. Honestly, to me, it sounded a whole lot like the pandemic. Where people are just trying to hold everything together. Where you're just trying to drop anchor, you know, just trying to survive where you are and not get smashed against the rocks. Uh, whether it's your, you know, relationships or dealing with your kids in school or finances or whatever. It feels like the pandemic to me. And at some point in this great storm when everyone is panicked and upset, Paul, in his great maturity, stands up and says, I told you. <laughs> I told you so, you should have heeded my advice. But then he says, keep courage. He said that only the ship is going to be destroyed. No lives are going to be lost on this. And I know this because an angel appeared to me last night. So keep courage because we're going to be okay. But the ship is still going to be smashed to pieces. 14 days they were in the storm. Two weeks of fear and fighting. Two weeks when it was so dark, they could not see the sun or the stars. The storm raged on. And in the midst of the storm, people responded to it very differently. Some people gave up all hope. They gave up all hope of being saved. 
the sailors got sneaky. They snuck around, um, pretending like they were gonna lower the anchors or do something with the anchors, but instead, they started to lower the lifeboats because they were gonna get out and escape if they could. Well, Paul found out and told the centurion, the guard, he, and Paul said, look, either we all make it or nobody makes it. Either we all make it together or nobody's gonna make it. So the centurion made the soldiers stop. So the sailors cut the ropes on the lifeboats and watched as their last hope drifted away. Just before dawn, after two weeks of chaos and fear and drama, Paul gathers everybody together on the ship. They are exhausted. They haven't eaten. And Paul takes bread and he gives thanks to God. And he breaks the bread. And he starts passing out food to everybody. He says, I know it's been tough. I know that you are weary and exhausted. I know that you haven't eaten for two weeks. Eat. Everyone eat. As much as you need, as much as you want. And they all stopped in the middle of the storm. And they ate together. They found strength that they needed. And when they were finished, they took all the rest of the food and they threw it overboard because they knew this was the last chance. This was either make it or break it moment. Daylight came finally, and even though the storm was still raging, they decided that they would try to, to, to gently bring the ship uh, into the shore. That was their plan, but the ship hit a sandbar and the stern broke to pieces. The soldiers then planned on killing all the prisoners so they wouldn't escape, but again, the centurion stopped them just like the sailors and said we will all make it or no one will make it and he told the ones that could swim to swim ashore swim swim hard swim fast if you can swim jump out of the boat and swim to the shore now and he told the ones that could not swim find a piece of the boat and hang on to it and just float until you reach the shore it seems like when your ship crashes, whatever that ship is for you or for other people, it seems like sometimes when a ship crashes, there's always people who can make it to shore because they have the resources or they have the strength or they have the luck or they just somehow have the ability to just make it through just really uh, difficult things under their own power. They can just swim to, sh to shore. But there are always others, sometimes us, who were left too weak to make it by ourselves because we don't have the resources, because we think all hope is lost, because we think there's nothing left for us except to just die. But for those who were too exhausted to swim, for those who didn't know what to do, they found pieces of a broken ship to hang on to. It wasn't the whole ship. It wasn't the comfort of, of sitting on the dry ship, but they would found, find a piece of the broken ship and cling to it and just float until somehow the waves pushed them onto shore. It reminded me of somebody who is devastated by grief, who is drowning in sorrow, who maybe feels like they cannot make it one more day, and they find something, something to hang on to. Maybe it's a memory. Maybe it's a friend who calls them and says, get up. We're going to go out for coffee today. Maybe it's a dog that they have to walk or a garden that they need to tend. They cling to one broken, leftover piece of life and they hold on tight until they can reach the other side. Maybe it's somebody who's lost hope. And so they hang on to just a piece of something that will get them through. Maybe it's a broken relationship. Maybe, maybe the storms have wrecked it and they've tried everything that they can do to save that relationship. And they find that the relationship is broken in pieces. And the question is, what do we do now? And they find a broken piece to cling to. And they hold on for dear life until they make it to the side of the shore. And the thing about the scripture is that everybody made it to the shore. 
Everybody made it, not at the same time, not in the same way, but they all made it to the other side. And when they got to the other side, there were some native people who were waiting for them, people who built a fire, people who cooked a feast, people who fixed supper for them, the people who thought that they were lost, that they were going to die just a few moments before, found hope and food and friendship and peace on the other side. I kind of feel like we're in a rocky boat these days with the pandemic, with our denomination, with the country. I kind of feel like we're in the midst of a storm and nobody really knows if the boat is going to sail or if the boat is going to crash. But what I do trust is that we will make it to the other side. But it's going to take all of us. The soldiers and the prisoners, it's going to take the sailors and um, everybody together, uh, making it to the other side together. I feel like some of us are um, good swimmers and we'll make it fine and there will be other people who will be clinging to broken pieces. But the hope that I'm going to cling to today from this story is that despite the turmoil, despite the storm, despite the hardships that they faced, God's promise was, we're going to make it through. We will make it through to the other side. There will be a new chance, a new hope, a new life. It may not look the same. But we will get through this together. Today for our service, we are going to share Holy Communion together. And we literally take pieces of broken bread that symbolize to us the body of Christ. And we take this, these cups of juice which symbolize to us the blood of Christ. And when we partake of these broken pieces of bread and this little bit of juice, we are reminded of Christ who was broken on the cross whose ending we thought was final, because what's, what's more final than death, you know? Um, whose life was uh, uh, literally taken from him and the disciples were left scattered and in pieces. And then God made a resurrection. When there was no hope and no way forward, God made a, a resurrection in the dark. In the, when, before people even knew it was happening, God was already at work in the storm. So as you receive the bread and the cup today, I uh, pray that you might experience the presence of the Holy Spirit. That in whatever brokenness you may be facing at this moment, that you may be able to trust in the wholeness and the peace and the strength of Jesus Christ. That you might know without a shadow of a doubt that you will make it through to the other side. Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 733, Marching to Zion. Would you please stand?
May you know courage and may you know peace. Amen.